Welcome everyone. Can everyone hear me okay? Is my sound all right? Great. Well, on behalf of the board of the Metropolitan Chapter of the Victorian Society of America, it is my great pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker, Dr. Emily M. Orr. Um, I have the great fortune of calling Emily um, a colleague and friend. She currently serves as Assistant Curator of American Design at Cooper Hewitt Smithsonian Design Museum here in New York. Her book, Designing the Department Store, Display and Retail at the Turn of the 20th Century, forms the basis of her talk for us this evening, and we'll put a link to it in the chat. Emily holds a PhD in the history of design from the Royal College of Art and Victoria and Albert Museum, and she has recently co-edited the monograph E. McKnight Cowfer, The Artist in Advertising, which came out this fall. So 2020 has been a busy year for Emily and its attendant publication um, for the Cowfer book, also centered, centered on the graphic designer, will open later in 2021. Her talk tonight, Here Today, Gone Tomorrow, Transformations in Department Store Design, 1880 to 1920, will transport us back, in, back to time when the experience of shopping in department stores was rightfully revered and carefully designed to entice and impress. It was the golden era of these large retailers, and it is an era that, at this holiday season, on a snowy day here in New York, and in the midst of a pandemic, whilst many of us see and hear Amazon trucks going by at all hours, can feel oh so far away. So onward we travel with Emily and have her reaffirm and remind us of the power of display. Off to you, Emily. Well, thanks so much, Caroline, and thanks so much to the Victorian Society of New York for giving me this opportunity to share some of my research with you this evening. I'm really excited to tell some stories and share some images and um, take you on a visual journey into the world of department stores. I'll be talking primarily about stores in New York, Chicago, in London, so a cross-Atlantic story covering the time period about 1880 to 1920. And tonight, I hope to present a new view on the department store. Really, um, the department store is a space that we typically think of and study as, as a space of consumption. But I'm very excited about the department store as a space of production and a space of design production. In the period that I am speaking about, this turn of the 20th century, moment, there was a major shift in um, retail approaches and design approaches to the retail sector. Previously, there had been an axiom floating around in the merchandising business that goods well bought are half sold, meaning that if you choose the good wares to put on view, people will no doubt be attracted to them. During this time, the axiom shifted to become goods well displayed or half sold. So I'm interested in how the design of the retail space and the outlook on display really had great selling power, how businesses invested more so than ever before in the design of display, and how um, display had major counter effects on other aspects of the shopping experience. So I'm going to walk us through some stores and talk a bit about architecture, show windows, shop fittings, meaning casework and electrical systems, and then interior design and display. And these four more specific design professions really grew out of this um, new emphasis on display that demanded that buildings take on more windows to be filled with goods, that interiors expand in order to make more room for various commodities and that people be in charge of um, deciding what those spaces should look and feel like. And customers saw the speed at which the department store shifted in its design and in its display. Windows changed on a weekly basis, interiors changed with the seasons, and in a way um, this absolutely quickening pace of change conditioned consumers to come back to the store for a new experience. 
I'm interested in um, a concept of display that considers a number of scales. So from the grand scale of a building to the tiny scale of a hat stand that could be um, impeccably detailed. And I'm showing here a catalog from a major shop fitting firm, J.R. Pellenberg and Sons, which you'll see is the supplement to the 300 page pocket catalog the amount of fixtures um, that formed the organizational framework for both the design of the windows and the interior in the department store was vast. And in a way, the um, commodities that the shop fitter offered in the way of um, specification to type of good mirrored the catalog that the department store was selling itself for every category of goods that was sold on the sales floor a particular, a particular display fixture and form was um, created to fit it. I'm interested in taking us behind the scenes into the workshops um, to talk about where the design of the production was made. Sometimes that was in the basement, sometimes it was in the attics, sometimes we're going to be in window dressers studios, um, sometimes we'll be visiting shop fitters who were outside the city center making things like mannequins. Here I'm short showing the major shop fitter, Harrison Sheldon, um, based in Birmingham. And this shop fitter in particular boasted um, their ability to keep up with the changing in style in the fashion world. They had employees on staff who had direct um, connections to the dressmaking business. So they could fit forms that were um, particularly well suited to the new silhouettes as they came into the stores. And when we think about the department store, I think the space that we think of as being the most designed and the most rapidly changing is that of the show window. Here we can see how theatricality in the show window has been going on for decades. Around the time of the building of the Brooklyn Bridge, there was a whole spurt of um, windows that celebrated this technological marvel, as well as the artistry and capability of the designers who were able to build um, an image of the Brooklyn Bridge out of spools of thread. Um, one of my favorite reviews of a design of this time was a magazine article that said that the original engineer for the Brooklyn Bridge actually came to a New York City window and inspected it in every detail and proclaimed that indeed, um, this was a one-to-one -one <laughs> mock-up. <laughs> but um, all that said, you know, the show window is really um, a timely mark of what's going on in the city around it. It registers the energy on the city streets. It speaks to current events. It speaks to current artistic movements. Um, so it's really a register of what's going on in the world around us. It's a place where consumers expect to see change and want to see change and innovation. And I can't help but just take a quick moment to pause um, on our current situation and call attention to this New York Times article of recent that proclaimed holiday windows aren't over, neither they say is New York. So show windows have always been endowed with great symbolic weight. They carry a message, they can carry a meaning. Um, for stores historically, they've been a place to both celebrate consumerism, but also celebrate culture. Um, and I think you know, in thinking about the, the speed and the change that the culture of the department store entails, um, actually seeing that um, those mechanisms manifest right now and that change keep coming and the windows still reflecting our contemporary moment. This, in fact, this pace of change is reassuring um, to us and is nostalgic. Maybe we're nostalgic for the experience of walking in that store. Um, and just to show that this Macy's window is celebrating essential workers. So still, contemporary messages are being um, conveyed and listened to. And now, um, these images of these show windows reached me through the New York Times and the internet. I haven't been to stand in front of them in person. Here, the actual intention of the window as a show window, something to conspicuously show off goods and call attention to itself, cannot for me this season be um, experienced in person. I'm experiencing it um, via imagery. And 
something that I think is interesting is that this is not so far off um, from how this was done historically. But to a quick point about our contemporary moment before I leave it, I think it's worth calling attention to, attention to the stark material shift that has occurred. So now we're able to see the message of the store window, celebrate its transparency. But earlier on in the pandemic, I think it's also telling that so many stores blocked up their windows and denied us the ability to see inside, see what they were selling, see how the store was designed and carry any message um, whatsoever. So just a side note on the contemporary you know, relevance um, of these store windows and how we're experiencing them, them today. But what I started to say about imagery um, and how the images of those show windows are reaching us all primarily through image, in the same way, um, at the turn of the 20th century, department stores were celebrating their display strategies and in fact advertising them via postcards, via pamphlets and brochures. So here you don't dwell on any of the individual um, characteristics or qualities of the merchandise for sale. But instead, what's being pitched to consumers is the overall experience of the design of the display. And Marshall Field sent out dozens of postcards. The one on the left, in fact, celebrates an opening in 1908 that the store had that they called an interior decoration event, at which, in fact, no merchandise was for sale whatsoever. People were invited to come and marvel at the skill of the displaymen. Those from neighboring stores shut down so their staffs could come and take a look at this new display. At the center is a Tiffany mosaic that topped Marshall Fields that they were very proud of as a distinct architectural feature. And then at the right is um, one of my personal favorites showing how the stratigraphy of Chicago was in fact um, absolutely embedded in the architectural format and um, design of the department store itself and how those um, layers of buying and selling and shipping and mailing intermingled with um, the transport systems of, of the city. It's very much, you know, an emblem of, of the city itself. So in the way of um, ephemera that I have tracked down that has traced these changing styles of display and celebrated um, the wonderful marvels that stores put forward in terms of their interior design experience. Um, there's nothing better that I've found than this mailing that's a Christmas time mailing, so I couldn't resist sharing it with you all, that went out to a woman named Mrs. Vernon Baker who lived in Saratoga Springs, New York, I think in about the Christmas of 1894. And when Mrs. Vernon Baker opened this envelope, she would have found this mailing called the Model Department Store. Um, she would have seen how this piece of ephemera is exploiting architectural grandeur as marketing strategy. She would have read that um, this new building that Abraham and Strauss had built at 420 Fulton Street was six stories high, full of plate glass. Perhaps she imagines that behind every pane of glass stood a new category of good. You could have gotten an impression of the window display down below. This model sends the impression of um, uh, a very sound business, but also the room for creativity in the design of the displays that it shows. Um, it's a new monument for, for Brooklyn, a new shopping monument for Brooklyn. But it gets better. So apologies for the slightly fuzzy photograph, but this was in fact um, a three-dimensional cutaway model that Mrs. Baker could have opened to show a trapezoidal view of the sales floor. The six um, levels of the store contained, when opened out, could be viewed um, flat. It mimicked the visitor experience. So here you're greeted by shopkeepers. You can see what awaits you up above if you take the journey to an upper tier, to furniture, to dresses, to those goods that require either, um, they're bulky and they're weighty, so they require being shelved on an upper tier, or perhaps it's a more personal shopping experience to find a hat or a dress and you need that, that quiet space. We can gain um, an understanding of how the design of the interior is really shaping our sightline and is encouraging us to navigate the space in a certain way. 
And best of all, this model came with a sheet of cutout dolls that are numbered on the bottom so as to fit in the blocks that are denoted on the trapezoidal floor. So here we have saleskeepers, shoppers, architectural elements like a clock that really made all the headlines when Abraham and Strauss publicized their new store. Um, we have some of the casework, some decorative details. But what I think is, is so interesting here is um, if we take a step back and think about the title of the model department store, Sure, this mailing was in fact a model, something that you could cut out, play with, and assemble. But I think um, that word is a very careful one that Abraham and Strauss used, uses here. They're setting themselves up as the model department store, the paragon, um, the ultimate of the department store as a model of business. And for them, again, um, what they're putting forward as really their point of innovation and their unique angle on being the model department store is the architecture, it is the interior design, it is how the goods are displayed. Um, we can't see much of their detail, but the overall impression that we gain is that this is a store um, that cares about design and that one can come and visit this store for a uniquely designed experience. And so it's in this period at the turn of the 20th century when we have businessmen, those in design professions, um, those working at the department stores, working at shop fitting firms, teaching classes, all trying to figure out what the ideal characteristics are for the model department store. And so starting out um, with architecture, thinking big and going small, I'll now kind of lead us through the four elements that I talked about, um, architecture, show windows, and interior design and shop fittings. And in thinking about how stores um, prioritized architecture as a display element, this advertisement from Schlesinger and Mayer is a good one. Um, certainly, this advertisement is positioning the reader in the position of a consumer walking by, a, pass, um, a passerby to this store. Looking up at the stories, the main message here is windows, of course, which Schlesinger and Mayer um, really capitalized on, developed a unique design detail for, and is accentuated by the Sullivan ironwork that not only um, decorates the facade, but also makes its way into the graphic um, design for the, um, the advertisement itself. And the message here also implies speed and change. Um, this is advertising the opening of a new store. And the message here is in two days, another great store. So there's a cycle of invention and reinvention. Um, this advertisement is promising us that this building is going to offer a new retail experience. Now, we think of architecture as something that's relatively permanent. Um, there are a lot of civic structures being built um, in cities at this time, but at the same time, retail districts are um, under great construction and blocks are being built up, stores are expanding. And so um, in thinking on the theme of speed and change, I think architecture can also um, you know, fall, fall into that. Um, in many cases, Construction and shopping happen side by side. Um, here we see an image of Mandel's department store in Chicago. The store is trying to stay open as much as possible while expanding. And inevitably, one of the primary reasons that stores expanded was to make more room for these glorious show windows that designers demanded and that businessmen were guaranteeing would bring um, more sales or the addition of um, a new department or an elevator. So I think um, the construction of the shopping stores themselves sent the message to the consumer that um, innovation was on its way and that stores were eagerly trying to stay up to date. Now in terms of architectural features that were prioritized, in addition to the show window, which I'll get to, um, the central atrium was also a primary one. This set up an architectural framework that allowed vision across its floors. It also set up an armature onto which decorations could be viewed. So here I'm showing two views of um, the interior of Wanamaker's atrium. 
alternately um, dressed for different holidays, but giving an entirely new look. So thinking about architecture in the service of display and decoration. And nothing says that more prominently than um, perhaps considering the prominence of um, the column and the classical style for these department store buildings. Here we can see Marshall Fields in Chicago um, dressed up in decorations for Lincoln's 100th birthday. So the columns are um, the perfect backdrop for holding the draping flags. And the columns also support the entire facade itself to leave room for the great glass windows beneath them. So now in thinking about the show window as an element that's um, of course intrinsic and in fact driving architectural change itself, um, this is very linked of course to the material of glass. And here we have materials actually dictating um, display styles and shifts. So at the left, I'm showing um, a hat warehouse from the, the first third of the 19th century, whereby we can see um, a gridded layout that is dictated with one pane of glass taking one commodity. And this was a display style that was typical for most things um, other than textiles up through the late 19th century. But then with the introduction of plate glass, we can see goods taking on an acrobatic effect that had never been possible before. They can carry across a whole expanse. A story could even um, travel between two windows. So there is um, great possibility that comes at the hand of window dressers when plate glass makes its way um, into production and starts to fill the facades um, of these department stores. Not only does it allow for um, more theatrical arrangements at, arrangements at the front, but it also plays the practical role of letting a good amount of light um, into the interior and making it a more um, comfortable place and pleasant place to shop around in. So in, in thinking about the space that the window dresser occupied himself, um, here we see the window trimmers department as it was illustrated in a publication of the late 19th century, a guidebook. And this is very much of an idealized vision um, along the lines of the model department store. But here we can see the place of making for the window dresser, um, the one who's in charge of putting forward a new design every week. And what this image implies to me are the tools and technologies that the window dresser ideally would have had at hand to make these displays possible and to make their switchover possible. We can see an array of mannequin forms, of um, fabrics to drape, of tools to use. Um, so he has a whole menu um, of options, curtain rods, nic nickel fixtures, wax figurines. So here I'm very interested in um, the objects that were in fact not for sale, but facilitating the sale. There were a lot of technologies that came into service so as to um, aid this changeover in display and increase the speed at which it was possible. So here's one patented show window construction that allowed the display to be built in the basement and then raised up on a platform to window level so that the window could be um, made in the basement, say during business hours, and that that making wouldn't have to take the precious place of display while the store was open. And these, um, this patented technology, I believe, made its way into Lord and Taylor as of uh, 1912. So in the way of um, the types of styles that emerged, if we look at guidebooks and photographs of the period, we can see a canon of window display types the best of which known is probably the stocky window. Um, its name suggests an emphasis on um, certainly profusion and variety. So here we see a Liverpool window from about 1900 that shows how the window dresser and the business owner is taking advantage of as much space as possible behind that expensive plate glass to um, absolutely stock it with an encyclopedic range of goods. 
But what this does not allow for is really a view into um, the design and skill of the window dresser himself. Um, it's really um, more of like a rote method of just displaying the catalog of what the store owns, but doesn't allow really for much artistic intervention or easy changeover. Another major category um, of goods that the department store sold in bulk were white goods. And herein lies the window dresser's probably um, most skill intensive work and maybe most popular um, with viewers as well. So textiles were pliable. They could be folded and molded and made sculptural into any number of in infinite varieties. And here we see a quatrefoil that individually would combine to make up a sculptural window, such as this one, done by a window dresser um, for Abraham and Strauss. Here, we see not only his handiwork on view, but also the framework of the shop fittings are very obvious to us as well um, as a tool that was used to achieve this design. And this is the only image that I have found that includes a display, a finished display product and the um, designer behind it together in the same view. This was widely published in magazines as celebrated, it won prizes. Um, and this kind of spectacle can not only be achieved by um, the skills of the hand, but the window also celebrated the skills of the machine. And as of the 1880s, windows um, were incorporating steam power. So Macy's, for instance, started spinning dolls with steam power for their holiday windows. And inevitably, um, the stylistic trend swung the other way. By the time we get to the first few decades of the 20th century, there's the introduction of a method called the unit principle, whereby the window dresser should choose one category or a single item to highlight, perhaps introducing variation by the use of colored light or a simple prop. But here, the focus is really on the quality and the material of the good itself that you can see clearly and um, appreciate in a kind of microscopic way rather than um, be overwhelmed with a larger message or artistic um, statement that might not relate to the function or the integrity of the good itself. So window dressers made a statement to um, always try to stay as up to date as possible in their practice and endless guidebooks were produced the one that I showed before that um, pictured the interior of the window dresser studio was called the wide awake window dresser. And this term wide awake comes up again and again as window dressers and the whole retail industry is desperately trying to prove that they are staying on top of things, wide awake, up to date. And here we see um, an economist training school in New York advertising that at their, at their store, you can learn to do the new cubist drapes these cubist and futurist drapes that they claim are ultimately timely. Current tendencies in art find first expression here. So this alignment with modern art um, and the armory show, of course, in looking at the date of the advertisement, um, would have been a clear signal to those interested in the trade or those businessmen looking to hire window dressers as graduates from this school that they would be fully versed with um, the latest artistic tendencies in the field. Now this strive for um, a modern look and feel in display and decoration translated, the, the message was first sent from the show window, but once the consumer entered the space of the store, um, material played a large part. So countering the stocky style of the show window and um, the much more crowded interior feel of stores in the late 19th century. Here we have a great introduction of plate glass on the interior as well. So as the window display becomes more sparse and more open, that same feeling um, begins to greet the consumer as they enter into these vast emporiums. Sight lines were immensely critical. critical um, stores boasted of their block long views so here we see that's the case with Marshall Field. And almost as if walking down this central aisle is like walking down a boulevard and taking in the window displays um, side to side. 
shop fitters individually um, also specifically messaged on this emphasis on plate glass in their casework. And the window display itself taught the consumer to shop um, just by looking with their eyes through, through visual analysis. And here this casework is pushing the same message. Um, when she sees, she buys, implying that a clear view of all the merchandise will support um, a good decision made. And in fact, taking it a bit further, here the shop fitter is even suggesting that the casework can perhaps um, replace the role of the shopkeeper himself, no longer needing to rely on them to get something down, to show it to the customer. They have all that they need and could desire um, right there just by scanning with their eyes. Fixtures, just as they did in the show window, also helped um, with variation and variety and visual excitement um, on the interior. And they were just as, as um, specified for particular categories of merchandise. So here we have the umbrella section at Selfridges taking a very familiar object when combined with some shop fittings becomes entirely unfamiliar to us. Um, these are to make the umbrella almost fall into the hands of the consumer. We can see some tactics here that are being used. Um, chairs that are positioned at an angle so as one can just take an easy seat. Handles that are reaching out ready to be grasped. And this was a postcard that um, you know, Selfridges sent out um, along with you know, a whole um, cache of other interior shots of their departments, department by department, again showing that they were you know, immensely proud of the design and display of their wares, even something as banal as an umbrella to us. Um, they've made exciting via the technologies of display and are featuring on this, on this card to entice people to come to the store. And while fixtures can give an impression of um, a kind of a lightheartedness and a sculpturalness to qualities um, and give a sense of fantasy, I think there's also another perhaps counter um, aesthetic going on that has to do with vast organization, um, alignment with and principles of um, scientific management, tailorism, specificity, organization. Here, all of the fixtures and the design of this um, department are sending um, a message of um, control, of sorting, of, um, of profusion, but in a very organized manner. Um, so this is about regularity. It's about mass production. Um, it's about efficiency. And here, I think um, the speed of the department store is very evident in the amount of people um, and the infrastructure there ready for you to help you make the purchase that you intend to make. The interior of department stores was for sure um, a great spectacle. And um, this is an incredible um, example of kind of architectural duplicity that happened in the period um, when Siegel Cooper showed the statue of the great republic a replica of it um, from the World's Columbian Exposition, surely sending the message to all consumers who walked in that um, the great spectacle that they might have experienced or seen in images years before could here be experienced again on the floors um, of their merchandising palace. And what this black and white photo doesn't show you is that over top of the statue, um, there were fountains, there were lights that changed color. Um, this is where the store really created a great um, focal point for visitors, not only to marvel at it, but interestingly enough, they installed benches in this area. And reports in the press talk about how that was one of the most clever design decisions they ever could have made. Um, they encouraged visitors to sit down here, take a seat, and just watch um, the speed and the efficiency and the tenor and, and feeling of the department store around them and um, be amazed by it. And this became not only a, a place for the show to, for the department store to showcase its best and most exciting wares, but they also advertised it as um, a meeting point, as a landmark. 
So they produced a whole series of, of merchandise, this purse included, that's in the collection of the New York Historical Society. That's called um, Meet Me at the Fountain. So the department store had this incredible ability to break down time and place. So, you know, when you walked into Siegel Cooper and saw that statue of the Great Republic, you might have been transported back to a World's Fair. Or when you walked further into the new Wanamaker building in New York and you came across um, an interior home called the House Palatial, you would have been transported to um, eras before of style and decoration. So I showed previously a few images of Wanamaker's atrium space that was for the most part um, left open and empty. But um, in 1908, they built a home, a model home in the atrium that was um, complete with four stories of interiors, instructing consumers on how to go about decorating in this variation of styles. So at the same time that the department store is trying to keep up with its own methods of retail, showing its own um, kind of ingenuity in terms of um, best practices of display, they also have to keep up with um, the changing styles of interior decoration that are circulating on the market. So I think I, I like to think of the department store as an interior of interiors. In fact, um, it was. Um, it offered time travel and virtual travel and was really um, a place of fantasy in some respects, but also, as I've mentioned, a place of instruction. And this um, model house served both of those roles. Um, it was very theatrical. There are reports of women walking in and seeing candles lit as if you are interrupting a dinner that had just finished in one of these drawing rooms. Um, there were apparently even um, actors and actresses dressed up to play family members or servants. But at the same time, you were meant to be encouraged to think of um, these interiors as possibly your own. Um, how could you live in this um, fantasy world yourself and, um, you know, follow along um, and learn some practical instruction from what this house is offering you? And indeed, um, this is kind of the point on which I will end in the way of this kind of march of styles in this period. We have you know, the rise of the design profession of interior decoration, which found um, an incredible um, training ground and partner in the department store that not only started showing the march of styles in, in period rooms and offering advice about how to design and decorate but um, started whole building departments that were of assistance to consumers, not only in choosing how to decorate their home, but also keep their home um, in the way of um, utilities and architecture and upkeep. And I enjoy this image of the building department at John Barker because um, it's set up for the consumer to make all of the decisions that they have to make. The wall coverings are unrolling for them. Um, there are some pictures pinned to the wall, the bathtubs at the corner. So the interior is being represented here um, as a kit of parts, as a, a series of design elements that one can combine um, into um, you know, the dream interior of their own. And I think, I hope what I've shown is that the department store was conceived in much of a similar way. Um, uh, series of designed elements that when combined would produce um, an absolutely innovative and effective shopping environment. And while working on this topic, I decided to take the perspective of um, the designer more than any other. But throughout the course of my research, um, I kept wondering about, um, you know, really the stories of the consumers of these spaces and wanting to get at those personal stories. And um, I'll leave you with um, the best that I found. So I originally went into this project thinking that I would want to map the objects that the department store sold um, and find those in museum collections and see if I could match them up to the particular stores and the people who bought them and what kind of constellation of understanding would come out of those objects. 
And in the end, as I mentioned, I, I started to discover that I was more interested in the objects that were not for sale, the objects that facilitated the sale. Um, and I was still, I was still hoping for that personal story of the consumer in the end. And on one of my last days of research, I ended up um, in the attic at 18 Stafford Terrace, which I'm also showing to this group thinking that perhaps many of you have been there or you should go. Um, it's a great house in West London that's been preserved to a T and was owned by a cartoonist for Punch and his wife. And um, they are an ideal example of an aspirational couple who bought anything and everything they could from the department store. They were um, the ones going into all of the London shops and um, navigating those sales halls and looking in the glass cases and being enticed by things in the show windows and entering model rooms. Many of the goods in this home have receipts that tie them back to the department stores themselves, as well as repairs that they did on the home. So windows replaced um, very early electrification for London. So I, I like this example because it does show us um, how intrinsically involved the department store was in the design of um, consumer spaces in their homes as well. So that's where I'll, I'll leave you all tonight. Great, Emily, thank you so much. What a treat, this was fantastic. Um, I, we have a few questions in the chat and please if anyone else wants to add anything and I'll go from there. I'm just going back to the top um, and this was early on in your PowerPoint, but correct me if I'm wrong and Joseph asked this, the um, Abraham and Strauss, that is now the Macy's, right, on Fulton Mall that has just it had is. a little bit of sprucing up, I believe. Is that right? Yes, that's exactly right. Um, it is the, the Macy's there. And in fact, that's where the Macy's archive is held. <laughs> so I've in fact been in there to view um, the material that they have. That good architectural eye. We're living um, with the kind of ghosts of many of these department store buildings still in New York. Do you have any, do you know when that went, became a Macy's or was it, was, did, did, Abraham and Strauss get folded in today. Yes, and I'm afraid I don't know that year off the top of my head, but. Great, um, another kind of location question. Um, Lynn was wondering about the Wanamakers. Was that at Broadway and Ninth Street? Does that sound about right, is cast iron? Yes, Astor Place. So there are two, um, two buildings there. You'll actually see Wanamaker Way, I believe it is. Oh. Um, that's off of Broadway that leads to Third Avenue. And then, um, yes, there, the, the big two cast iron buildings in Astor Place were both owned by, by Wanamaker. And perhaps even um, more interesting is in the Astor Place station, you'll see as you pull in um, to Astor Place, Kmart now has their show windows there. But in fact, Wanamaker was the one who decided to integrate the show window into the transport system in New York. So you could be enticed to walk right into the store right off the platform. That's great. A um, couple others. Did late 19th century luxury makers, oh, this is great, that Eve is wondering, like Herder Brothers, um, Associated Artists, mm -hmm. The Guild, um, Shasti, did they have a presence in department stores or were they all completely independent, sort of their own little guilds? Was there any tie there? I know at least decorators would have been working with them and I assume would it be also in and out of department stores, but is that, were they kept sort of separate? I think it probably depends shop to shop. Certainly, um, some major stores had art galleries in which they showed kind of upper tier items and would combine, for instance, um, a painting with a cabinet with some ceramics um, to make a grouping and would do designer showcases. And so I imagine um, if any of those more expensive wares, um, you know, made it into the department store in any great quantity, it might have been through actually um, the art gallery itself. Interesting. So almost like an in-house, like a, a Marshall Mercier, but of the 20th century or something, sort of cobbling together. Yes. And, and so many stores really prided themselves on having their own house brand, even though, of course, it wasn't necessarily signaled in that way. But um, 
they had great trade relations with manufacturers around the world and um, kept those relationships specific mm -hmm. to their own business model. So um, there wasn't as much kind of um, wares by other designers who were named, I would say. That's interesting, yeah. Um, I, this, is, this is a fun one from Alexis. Is there a particular historic department store that you really wish you could go back and visit? <laughs> I know so many of the images you've shown, I mean, I, I, um, they're incredible, especially some of those postcards. I mean, it's just, I don't feel like there is anything comparable right now. Is there anything that's really, um, throughout your research, you've really been taken with, or you feel like they really went above and beyond for various reasons? <laughs> I mean, it is a visual delight for sure. I think this time of year returns us to that era. You know, um, more attention than ever is played to the artistry of design and display. And we can see how um, really the aims of the trade remain the same. You know, it's to make us stop on our tracks. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, Eve is wondering, how did you get interested in such an ephemeral art form as department store decor and window displays how yeah what what spark what was the first spark of interest well i've long been interested in um, retail design at large and started um during my master's doing some research on fashion retail even in the 1990s and 2000s in new york and thinking about overlaps with the museum experience so when there were museum exhibitions of fashion and we saw um, fashion stores really taking on a more museum-like atmosphere. Mm -hmm. And everything that I had read about retail history, it seems like the department store was always on the starting point. Um, what is the starting point for retail history? It's the department store. But um, what struck me was that there wasn't much that had been tackled about the actual um, layout of the department store space, why it made an impact in terms of um, the design world. And I tried to crack that code. And um, I'm very interested in design professionalism and how changes in taste and cultural and politics, um, cultural context, produce the need and desire for new design professions. And that's what I found with um, the department store. It's really this inter very interesting story of um, design professionalism. Mm -hmm. Well, actually, that gets to my biggest question was, I was so struck, I mean, at various points, but especially at the beginning, not just of the consumer side of things, but of the economic potency within the stores themselves. I mean, you were throwing around all these professions that I hadn't even, I never even really heard of before. When did I? <laughs> and I was just wondering, is, um, did you find that there are a lot of records of that sort of thing? Is that, um, am I... Am I misunderstanding it because it seems so new? Um, do you get the sense that they were sort of generators of their own little kind of um, little micro economies there? I'm just thinking of all the people working inside the store, but on the store, the architecture. I know it's a great time, generally broad, very broadly speaking, of um, you know city building. It's certainly in the United States, but um, no, that's a great question. In the way of um, the window dressers, we really see them coming out of a number of existing professions. Mm -hmm. So a lot came from the world of theater um, or performance, yeah. um, which is perhaps not a surprise in terms of the analogies of you know building a set and the curtain that closes and opens every night. <laughs> um, others came from you know advertising or were fine artists or sculptors. Um, industrial design. So certainly it was a feeder profession for any number of fields. And um, the literature and schools of the period promoted that to be a good window dresser, you had to be a good electrician, plumber, builder, um, artist, sculptor, you had to do it all. So it required a really unique set of skills um, that all came together to kind of follow under that name. Mm -hmm. um, in the way of um, the shop fitters, they're an interesting story because certainly um, I think with the rise of World's Fairs, the demand for um, complex casework systems and wayfinding and passenger travel comes out of that fair culture of the 19th century, but also then carries into um, the museum world. So you see shop fitters that start out just by servicing 
the retail business and you watch their masthead grow over the course of 40 or 50 years and they grow from just managing showcases um, to managing um, you know, the building of entire museum structures. And we all know as people that go to both museums and shops, many of the considerations are the same in terms of access to wares, um, height and width of navigating through a space, showing things off. So um, some of the industries that grew out of the retail trade then had, had tentacles um, to other overlapping sectors. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. I was struck of, in a few of the images too. It reminded me a little bit of science museums also, like all of the glass and you'd come, you know, you're sort of entreated to come right in and get very close and maybe touch something, but almost like cataloging specimens, as you say. I mean, there's such a sort of efflorescence of goods, the sense of ordering and categorizing, um, in my mind, kind of comes out of that same school of thought. Definitely so. Um, the impression of order is key when you're actually selling or exhibiting hundreds of things you know you want to give um, a sense of creativity and um, discovery but also a sense of order and organization so that the visitor or consumer isn't so overwhelmed they just turn right around <laughs> um, I wanted to, let me see if there are any others in, in the chat. Oh yeah, was there a point when sight lines um, recommended for the stores became more maze-like, so to sort of keep the, buy, the um, customers wandering? Um, and actually on top of that, that's from Eve, but for me too, I wondered if, you, if you'd encountered anything about um, display as a whole, but how that was shifting um, in conjunction with sort of gendered notions of who the shopper was um, and, and why. Both great questions. Um, in the way of sight lines, there's certainly a balance between wanting to give the visitor a clear understanding of where to find and reach the wares that they're seeking. But also there's a lot of um, subtle and not so subtle display tactics built in in order to hold the consumer there for longer. Um, because of course, the more time you spend in the store, uh, and the more you have to, you know, time you have to spend looking around for what you're seeking, the more you might likely buy. So um, the idea of wares that are um, tempting and easy just to pull off the shelf is definitely present at this time, entice people with that type of thing, um, mm -hmm. and then make them climb to reach that bureau that they really want to purchase because they will make the effort to get there. Um, and in the way of display, certainly large sculptural arrangements and you know figures were placed along large sight lines. So giving the visitor the idea of expansiveness that they have so much more left to, dis to discover um, is certainly an advantage. Um, mm -hmm. But um, in the way of, of gender, that's, that's a great question. I mean, the department store has been written at a lot from a gender studies, um, women's studies angle in that it was a place where a woman could go on her own and um, make her own decisions um, and not have to be tempered by, you know, the demands and needs of others. Um, and also the department stores of this era made a big point of um, advertising that one could walk in and look and there was not always pressure to buy. Mm -hmm. So that was also enticing to men who maybe weren't as um, comfortable shopping around for the types of things that the household needed or Stores also built on um, their own men's sections, men's wings, um, so that a man, if he entered this world of the department store, could go directly to his designated zone, um, where there was probably also, um, you know, a room where he could sit down and write a telegraph or put his feet up, um, you know, in a club chair and have a snack. Um, in essence, a living room and shopping oh, zone <laughs> in two, but spaces were um, incredibly gendered. Yeah, yeah. Um, Loretta asks, were certain emporiums particularly noted, you found, for innovations in service or design or marketing? Um, and I guess that, uh, so to piggyback on that too, were certain department stores, you know, they, they sold it all, but were different ones known for different things or did you, were you finding a lot of differentiation in that way? Mm -hmm. That's a great question as well. I think um, 
one of the interesting things in thinking about architecture and interior design is that that was really the element that um, designated the department store against its competitors. Um, mm -hmm. I think largely the merchandise they were selling, I won't say it's the same, but it was really quite similar. Um, mm -hmm. They were all buying from major manufacturers locally and globally. Um, sure, more had access to um, railway lines or maybe a distinct connection with a buyer, but um, more or less it really was everything available under one roof um, from cradle to grave, as they said. Um, and so I think one of the reasons I argue that um, design and display were leveraged so much were, was that that was um, the distinctive feature that the store carried and could advertise as um, being something that they could distinctly offer that other stores could not. Yeah, the all-in-one place shopping experience. Yeah. On that note, and just for a bit of brevity, is there anything you've come across that you were really, really surprised was once found in a department store or conversely that wasn't, that didn't seem to be available that may have frustrated consumers? Uh, that's a fun question. I think <laughs> um, I mean, one of the things that people might not know about the department store with like, all the services that it offered, um, you know, department stores had dentist offices. Um, they really did make coffins. Um, wow. they, they did funeral services. Um, they also had um, some child care and, and daycare offered um, hair salons, as I mentioned, telegraph stations. Um, so it was really much more um, than a shopping experience. And to consider that they were handling all of those distinct um, units in addition to retail is, is really mind boggling. Um, I guess a good statistic about um, the kind of speed and, and merchandising pace of the department store is that Marshall Fields claimed to sell an article of fur every six minutes. So, um, you know, you consider um, the amount of infrastructure and organization that was needed to both bring goods in and ship them out. Um, it's incredible. But department store catalogs are, are hundreds of, of pages long. Mm -hmm. That's great. Um, well, let's see, I'm just going to double check to see if there are any other questions. Um, but this was so fascinating, Emily. Thank you so much. Um, really, really appreciate you being with us. And if I may, um, I actually wanted to, con to conclude with something. I'm going to paraphrase a bit from your um, section on season <laughs> seasonality from your book, <laughs> where you said Christmas time was a highlight in the calendar when displaymen were encouraged to take design and interior decorations to an artistic extreme. Um, these would have included crepe paper poinsettias, festooning chrysanthemums, folded tissue bells, and papier-mâché Santa Clauses, <laughs> with the goal of making the Christmas trim as gay and elaborate as possible. <laughs> A very timely description. <laughs> um, so thank you, Emily, so, so much. We really appreciate it. And we'll do a little, if anyone wants to unmute, a little round of applause. I will. <laughs> I'm already unmuted. Um, Thank you so much. Great. Thanks so much for having me and for listening. It was really a pleasure to share some stories with you all tonight. When does your Kaufer lecture tour start? <laughs> Soon enough. We'll keep you posted. <laughs> thank, you. Thanks, thank, you. Yeah. thank you so much. Really enlightening. Great. Thank you. Many, many thanks. Yeah. Thank Happy holidays, you. everyone.